Thanks for having me. We're going to talk a little about how we can automate some of our DevSecOps toil. Let's see here. All right. So there are a lot of things, like even in developer relations, where I log in every single morning and I feel like Sisyphus rolling that rock up the hill, right? Like there are these things that we have to do every day that are just a pain in the butt and we don't really want to have to deal with them. Um, this is more of a DevOps sort of stat, but there was a stat for DevOps engineers that found that uh, DevOps teams were taking 55% of their time just supporting and doing operations, like doing those that toil and those tasks that need to get done, but not actually like making their product better. And you know, we what I want to do is show you some tips on how we can automate away some of that, just like rolling the rock up the hill oil, annoying things that we have to do every single day. Um, and as an example, I'm going to give two examples. One is certificate renewals, and the other one is using lease privilege um, and the ways to automate some of that. And these are all using AWS. Of course, these principles go to other clouds, other platforms. I'm just using AWS as an example because, like, lots of people use AWS out in the cloud. Um, and... Just to show that these are actually real things, we're gonna tie these to two outages that happened last month um, that were as a direct result of somebody making a boo-boo with their DevSecOps. All right, so the first example we have here is, um, not here, but it, it, we have a house up in the mountains and we, there's no internet there. So we're using Mr. Musk's um, Starlink service, right? So it's a satellite dish, put it out in the yard and it's great. We don't have really any problems with it at all. So imagine my surprise one Friday night, about eight o'clock, as you can see, um, we went offline. And yes, my Wi-Fi is called Moosai. It's an inside joke of what is the plural for moose. Um, but like all of a sudden, like the internet went offline. I'm like, what the heck? That's sort of weird. Like, and why is it downloading an update? Like something weird is going on here. Friday night at eight o'clock is a weird time to take the system offline. And I tweeted about it and I started getting responses from people all around the world in Switzerland. This is clearly in Spanish. Other people were having the same issue. This was not my Wi-Fi going out or my Starlink going out. It was a worldwide outage. So imagine my surprise when a day later, a friend of mine sent me this tweet. Um, they forgot to renew their certs. And when they forgot to renew their search, they took down all of Starlink. Like everybody lost their internet. Um, we don't want this to happen. So if we can automate the idea of renewing our certificates, we can prevent this outage, an outage like this from happening. Um, right? Like facepalm, right? Get the card holding, holding head in hand, right? Like, oh, the search, somebody, somebody may have lost their job over this, unfortunately. Like. That's just because of the way this certain company sort of operates. Um, uh, the other one I want to talk about is, um, here we go, the platform we're using right now in April was having an outage because they didn't have their AWS permissions set up correctly. If you look right down here, uh, you know, they had a service control policy that wasn't set properly, right? They, they didn't set their permissions right. Um, and it broke Zoom. So let's talk about these two outages and how you might build some automation to prevent that from happening. So definition of automation, like let's just do stuff automatically. Let's like, there can be humans involved, but, or you could just have it run without humans, but like you can have this process where the system is looking for these issues automatically. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about an open source runbook automation tool. And the URL to the GitHub is down here. It's runbooks.sh. Um, what it is built on top of Jupyter Notebooks. And if you don't know what a Jupyter Notebook is, it is a way of doing Python snippets of code in your browser. And what's really neat is you can have text here describing what's going on, and then you have little bits of Python code. And as you run each little bit of Python code, you're generating a set of steps that complete a task. And that's sort of what a runbook is. A runbook is a set of steps that help you complete a task. And so this tool is built on Jupyter Notebooks. You build your runbooks, 
inside uh, the Jupyter Notebook, and then you can automate that. You can just run it. You can click these red buttons and just run it, and it goes. Um, what's cool about Jupyter Notebooks? Well, they're online. They're collaborative. Uh, there's nothing worse than having that script that fixes the problem on your machine, but you're on vacation, and someone has to bug you to run that script, right? We want these things online so that the whole team has access to, to, to the runbooks. Um, it's all written in Python. There's no DSL. Um, there's no YAML. I'm not going to say anything bad about YAML, but there's no YAML. Um, you can write the documentation in line with the code. And if there's steps that have to be done manually, you can write out all those manual steps in the Jupyter Notebook and then continue on to the future steps if it has to be run sort of uh, with a human being involved. Um, but what's really great about this is that it's easy to automate. Um, so let's talk about certificate renewals. Inside runbooks.sh, uh, there's actually a runbook that will re automatically renew all your AWS SSL certificates if they're close to expiration. And so the way this works is you've got a bunch of inputs into your runbook. And the uh, first one is your environment. This is deciding which credentials you're going to use. Um, you can see in this case, I'm using Doug. Uh, we often recommend like maybe you have a test set of environment and a production environment with different credentials, right? You're going to log into test with different credentials and you would log into prod. You can run the run book just by changing the environment to run in test or prod or dev or prod or whatever. So uh, I'm not picking an AWS region. If you don't pick a region, it automatically scans all 27 AWS regions for certs that are about to expire. And you can set the number of days. I want all of the certs that are going to expire within five days, right? And then you can get ahead of the game and not get surprised like the folks at Starlink were when they had an outage. All right, so the first, and so what's cool about this tool is that there are a lot of these, we call them actions, and you can just drag them in. When you load the platform, it's built on a Docker image. You can drag in these um, actions. And so this action gets all the AWS regions. So all it does is it uses your credentials, goes in and gets a list of all the AWS regions, right? You know, and it's, in, you know, South, Central, West, EU, US, all over the world, right? Um, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to get all the regions. Then we're going to loop through all the regions to get all the certificates that are about to expire. So step two is we have another action, just drag it into your runbook. Uh, this runbook is already built. So if you use this open source tool, Again, down at the bottom, runbooks.sh. You can just set up this runbook, add your credentials, um, and run it, and it just works. Um, but th these are sort of the steps. And if you wanted to use these in other runbooks, you can just drag them in. So now we're going to loop through this one um, and get in every single region all the certs that are expiring within five days. Um, and so the way we do that is we have an iterator. And so this iterator says for every region in that list of regions that we just calculated, run this. So it's going to run 27 times, right? We get 27 results. And then uh, that's going to create like this long list and a dictionary of all of the expiring certificates. And so I just wrote a little Python thing to extract out exactly what I wanted. And what I actually found is one of our certs was about to expire. Turns out we didn't need this cert anymore, but it's great to have this sort of heads up that these certificates were about to expire. Like I reached out to the team, like this one is not eligible for renewal. Do we still need it? And the team's like, no, we don't need it anymore. But like here was an alert, right? Oh my goodness, this could have caused an outage if we hadn't uh, run this, this uh, run book. So we've got this certificate. It's in US West to, we know the ARN. So we know the unique identifier for the certificate. And so step four is to take that ARN and send it to AWS and say, hey, renew that certificate. In this case, it wasn't eligible for a renewal and we didn't need it anyway. But with this runbook, now we can get a list of all the certificates at AWS and renew them before they expire. And what that does is just make sure that everything keeps running, right? This is a dumb mistake for things, for reason for things to break. Bonus step. Inside, uh, inside the tool, we actually have a schedule. So in this case, you know, this is running every single Monday at three o'clock um, GMT, I believe, right? So yeah, just three o'clock GMT, which means 11 o'clock Eastern. Um, why this is great is now you can run it every single week and get the certs that are expiring in the next week 
if you were going to do this and schedule it for once a week, maybe you want the threshold to be 10 days, right? Because if there was one of those expired after six days, you would miss it in your in your, uh, in your your scheduling. But you, you get the idea, right? This is a way that we can just automate this. Now you don't have to worry about it. As long as it, it while this run book is running, if it's running once a week, you're going to get an alert. You could have it send a message to Slack. Hey, these certs are about to expire and they couldn't get renewed. Or, hey, we just renewed all these certs and you don't have to worry about things expiring. You don't have to worry about these sorts of outages. Um, all right. The other one I want to show you is using the idea of least privilege. And I think if you're not aware of what least privilege is, is it's the idea of when you build an app, you only want it, the credentials utilized with that app to be exactly what is needed. You don't want to give it like a super admin amount of credentials because then if those credentials ever get compromised in any way, the blast radius of that um, well, that, that credential loss is bigger. Um, but if you've ever been in AWS and tried to work with um, IAM policies, like it is crazy. I'm not saying you need to be a rocket scientist. I know a lot of people here at Carnegie Mellon, like you guys are all really smart people, but like there's a lot going on in here. And it, I always find that there's a lot of trial and error. I don't spend all my time in here, but like I can, I'm never really confident that I got it right every single time I do this. And like I tried to set up an EC2 policy and there's already like 500 things and there's like 47 warnings that come up and like there's a lot to process here. And not being an expert in this, I'm always worried that I'm not doing it quite right. And if you're not doing it quite right, then you've got a DevSecOps problem, right? You've got a problem where your credentials aren't right. Um, if you go too little, you've got the Zoom problem. If you go too big, you know, you might have a bigger issue. Um, so again, like you build an app and you really want, once you've launched your credentials, for them to overlap, right? You don't want to have too many, the privilege of the app to be exactly what the app needs. And that's the principle of least privilege. Um, when I'm developing, I do this, right? I just use like crazy amount of credentials because like there's nothing worse when I'm building the app for there to be a credential issue. And then I've got to go in and go back into that console, which drives me batty to try to figure out what's wrong. So I'll just use like my dev credentials, which has way too much access to run this app to make sure that it's running properly. Um, but then when it goes to production, I need to do this. And then I have to go back into that console. And what I want to do is remove that toil. Because number one, I don't feel confident at it. Number two, I don't want there to be a security issue. And number three, I don't want there to be an outage because I went too low. Um, like, like Zoom did. So if you have too few credentials, right, then all of a sudden you get that Zoom error, right? Like there is a problem. We This user is not authorized to blah, 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 right? Not good. And obviously too much access is not good either because if the credentials get compromised or something else happens, if someone gets control of those credentials, like they have more control into your system. Um, so I always go back to the Goldilocks analogy, right? We don't want it to be too cold. We don't want it to be too hot. We really want our credentials to be just right. And so how can we do that? And can we automate this? And the answer is you can automate it. And by automating it, you make sure that when you launch this uh, app, your application from AWS into production, your credentials are following the principle of least privilege and they are just right. Not too little, not too big. All right, so the way we're gonna do this is inside of AWS, you use the cloud trail logs and the cloud trail logs monitor everything that's happening inside your applications, inside your whole AWS environment, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a runbook that's going to uh, build, take my giant orange credentials here and build this nice little green credentials right around my app just to you know, pinpoint it. And so how am I going to do that? I'm going to create a new IAM profile, a new uh, profile for permissions, and then connect it to a new IAM user and then attach it to my app and then I'm good, right? So how do I do that? I'm going to build a runbook and there's a bunch of inputs to this runbook. There are a bunch of things that we need to do. The first thing we need to do is we need to know which cloud trail has the data, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to run my app with my giant credentials here, right? 
my my ARN, my test, my test ARN, those are going to show up in the logs. And I can read the logs to pull out to pull out all of the access that was used by my application over the last couple of hours and build a new profile that fits that perfectly. And the advantage to this is I can have a couple of these test profiles, run my applications, build these profiles that are perfectly suited, and I know they're going to work just right, right? Fitting that whole Goldilocks idea. Um, so let's walk through the way this runbook works. Um, again, this runbook is available inside runbooks.sh, which is free and open source. Docker install, go for it. Um, or And you can also, these actions are also available. So you can just build them using this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all that information that I just showed in the last slide, right? The cloud trail, um, the ARN that I want to use, and I'm going to generate a policy. It takes a little bit. But once it's so we will wait until it's done. Sometimes I have to run this one a couple of times because it says in progress for a while. Um, but as soon as AWS process, processes all the logs, this will say finished. We can get the log from there. Um, and then it, it's going to give us the policy, all of the permissions that were used in the last, you specified the number of hours. I think I cut that off on the inputs here, but you can also say for the last one hour, tell me how, what was used. All right. Um, and so that policy is generated, and there's some stuff that we need to do manually to clean it up. One of them is that you need to add your account number. So I have an action here to just programmatically tell me what my account number is at AWS. And we're going to clean up the policy. And depending on what you're doing, you might need to go in here and write a little Python to make the policy perfect for what you're doing. But in the five or six experiments I did, this has worked perfectly. Um, and so this generates you know, a JSON file of my new um, security policy uh, for IAM at AWS. I can create that policy using another action and create an IAM user and then attach that policy to a user. And now I have this new IAM user with an ARN that I can apply to my application and it is just right. And everything runs just exactly as you might expect it to have to go. So I know we're getting close on time here. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, having me here. But what I want to talk about what in summary is that DevSec DevSecOps is a lot of manual processes. And making small mistakes to those processes have big implications, right? We saw in the talk uh, how Zoom had an outage and how Starlink had an outage because they just there was something just not quite right. And by automating some of these steps, we can reduce a lot of that manual toil. You can improve the accuracy and precision of what you're doing. Um, and what's cool about the tool that I'm showing you here is like I'm giving you two DevSecOps. Um, we've also built integrations to FinOps, right? So monitoring our cloud costs. Um, you know, I just got alert on Monday that all of a sudden our EC2 costs um, our NAT gateway started transmitting a whole lot of data over the weekend. I got an alert, right? This is a good thing because we found out on May 8th or 9th instead of uh, June 1st when that bill came out, right? And it was a crazy high bill. Um, you can do a lot of DevOps automation, SRE automation, and make, uh, make your job easier, right? Take away all of that oil that you have to do and, and automate what you're doing. Um, so again, uh, I'm Doug Sillers. I'm the head of developer relations at Unscript. If you wanna get a hold of me, I'm pretty much Doug Sillers everywhere on the internet, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of those places. Um, if you want to check this out, I would really appreciate it. We're at runbooks.sh. It is open source. It's free. Um, we love contributions. We love helping folks. If you have questions, you can reach out to me. We also have a Slack channel where you can ask questions as well. And with that, thank you so much for having me, and I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, Doug, thanks so much for that uh, that talk. That was uh, very interesting. Um, I think uh, what I got from that was typically, you know, when people think automation and DevSecOps, it's specifically CI, CD type stuff. But I think what you're, you're what I thought was cool is you're kind of looking at it from a, you know, a slightly different perspective, automating, you know, tasks, 
in your in your cloud environment. Um, things like you know certificates. Never thought of that. Um, I thought it was particularly interesting that you took a look at how the I basically based on what users were doing, developers accessing the environment, determining based on the logs how to fine tune your IAM policies. That was that was really cool. Thanks for showing us that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, so, see, generally, you know, what kind of other things can you think of that can be automated with this kind of setup in your in a cloud environment? Anything come off the top of your head? So, you know, I I, I mentioned at the end, like um, we do a lot of work. We've we've got a lot of our customers who are worried about the cloud costs. So, I have a cost and usage report at AWS. I have a runbook that runs every morning and looks to see if there is a change in any of the AWS products that we use day over day. And then it goes up by five, 10%. You know, I have it, I, I'm still working on getting that trigger perfect, but it'll send me an alert saying, like, hey, things are getting more expensive. Um, we also have health checks, right? So you can go in and say, hey, are my Kubernetes pods healthy? Um, looking to see, you know, is my, are the queries in my database taking too long? <laughs> if you can query these things and find that out, you can maybe uncover a problem before it becomes a capital P problem. Um, uh, there, and and in, in many ways, because it is Jupyter Notebooks, you can almost automate anything. Um, I just wrote a blog because I'm doing DevRel and I'm writing a lot of documentation. I wrote a script that takes the site map of my web page and looks for 404s, right? There's nothing worse than finding a 404 in your doc. So if I can write a script that runs every single time I do a pull, it'll tell me if I've made a mistake in the links and I can fix it before it starts impacting my my users. Nice, thanks. Um, so you mentioned alerts. I wanted to just, you know, how... I think another important aspect of this is how users are notified potentially of any issues. Um, can you kind of briefly discuss how you set up alerts and, and that sort of thing? Are you using any kind of particular messaging system or is it just directly through AWS to admins and that sort of thing? So there are a couple of ways we can do it. So we do have the ability that if there is an alert that's fired in like inside your Grafana or inside AWS that it can actually kick off a runbook to auto remediate that, that issue. Um, if you wanna go that route, like the fully automatic, so no one gets woken up at two in the morning. Um, but for a lot of the things that I'm building, uh, we can build a Slack message. We can send a Slack message to the right channel saying that, hey, there's an issue here. Someone needs to take a look at it. Um, we also have email alerts and things like that. But um, for the most part, we're dealing mostly with just Slack, but that's clearly easily um, configured for any sort of messaging platform that you wish okay. to use. Yeah, so we're basically talking about chat ops, right? The importance of chat ops in this process to mm -hmm. alert people when something happens that they need to look at. Um, right. Um, can you recommend any kind of particular type of training? I think we had a question in chat. Um, they're interested in, you know, any kind of uh, AWS labs or anything like this that you know of that relate to this particular topic. That's a great question. So AWS does have some, you have to dig around in the docs, which is sort of, um, but they do have some, some automated runbooks. Um, if you're interested in, you know, sort of these AWS runbooks, um, you know, it's, if you go to the open source or you go to unscript.com, we have about 30 or 40 of them that are AWS specific with descriptions as to why we built them and what we're trying to do around that. Um, specifically for DevSecOps, um, that's a great question. Um, I have blogged about these two issues um, at unscript.com. So you could find the blog post there, unscript.com slash blogs. Um, but there's not a lot out there, unfortunately, in automating DevSecOps. I'm working on it, but it's just yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, to get started, AWS has a has a free tier mm -hmm. for most things that you can kind of get started to, to play around with a lot of the features you mentioned, um, you know, specifically IAM policies. 
uh, and you can spit up virtual machines in EC2. Yes. Uh, and there's always, it seems like there's always a free tier for various, you know, flavors of Linux or that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, of course, of, LinkedIn learning. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's all. I, I just, I was going to say, I'm a big fan of learning by doing, like, right. Getting in there and playing around with those policies. And then you realize, like, man, I just want to automate this because this is a beast. Uh, yeah. You know, start looking at, AWS service quotas, and I haven't looked recently, but there's like, so a service quota is like how many things you're allowed to roll out, and they have over 2,000 of them, right? There's just so many things, there's so many knobs inside AWS that you really, it can be really tricky. Yeah, it can be really tricky and go off the rails pretty <laughs> fast too. And, you know, that's why you kind of mentioned the cost analysis. I think that's a important part of this too is making sure that you know you're sticking within your budget for such things um, absolutely so you know i think basically your application is running in an aks cluster it sounds like um so it's docker could, it's okay. docker so you can run it locally if you want to like i have it running on my mac in the back i don't know if you can see it up here at the top but it's running locally too um okay so, you know, you can deploy it anywhere you want. Um, it, there is also a, an enterprise platform that you can sign up for at unscript.com that has a free trial, but, you know, the free and open source is a great way to start. Yeah. And another thing, I think we only have a couple minutes left, but uh, I just wanted to point out that, you know, this stuff like using Python scripting to monitor certificates, IAM policies, really is kind of, cloud provider agnostic too. I mean, you could essentially do this with Azure, mm -hmm. um, Google Cloud Foundation, that sort of stuff. So, yep. yeah, I mean, I think this was a this was an excellent example of what, you know, again, when I, when I started the q and I was, I thought, you know, this is something that when we usually have these events is it's kind of outside the realm of typical CICD security processes. Yep. And I think hopefully the viewers got out of it that, you know, there's a, a lot of things that could be automated, certificate management, how to fine tune policies based on what you want to monitor, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, so again, Doug Sillers from Unscript, Head of Developer Relations. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me.